The first one that I've selected has to do with hydrogen sulfide emissions. Um, as a part of the, the granting program, um, do you, is there a, um, any request for trying to account for hydrogen sulfide and then any regulation of that? So is there, do you try to regulate hydrogen sulfide emissions yeah. from anaerobic yeah. digestion? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually, the good thing here is that, um, you know, because of air quality concerns that have been long standing in our Central Valley, California already has existing regulations on, you know, different types of equipment that produce the hydrogen sulfide or that can produce the, actually, I should say more specifically, that can produce socks out of the H2S that comes out of the biogas. Um, so all of these digester projects already need to um, use what we call best available control technologies and get permitted for air quality. And that usually includes a pretty high standard of H2S reduction that they have to meet. Um, so the equipment that they install already need to have H2S scrubbers connected to the engines or biogas plant um, to address that H2S. Um, and the cost of the equipment is allowable through our grant, so it helps support that um, that need. Okay, um, there's a series of questions that relate to the feeding of animals and nutritional aspects. Um, is that a part of any of the programs that you have uh, as options for the producers is to, to focus on the feeding and feed management pieces? Uh, yeah, at this time, unfortunately, it's not. And the main reason is because we don't quite still fully understand um, how the feed quality affects greenhouse gas reductions. Um, but that said, we do have, um, so you know, our program and our department works closely with another state agency called the California Air Resources Board. Um, that's the agency that manages or is the accountant on these cap and trade funds. And we've worked pretty closely with them and then they have funded a few projects at UC Davis to look at, um, you know, in the past to feed efficiency, but more currently now feed additives. Uh, one that's been a lot in the news and perhaps many of you might have seen or heard about is a red algae-based feed additive, and it's Dr. Armaios Cabral at UC Davis who's working on that. Um, there have been a few other studies to look at the algae as well and some other types of feed uh, additives, including a compound called 3-NOP, um, which is kind of like a bromine-based compound. Um, so there is a lot of interest in that area, and currently it's limited to the research and development side, and we're kind of keenly watching it, because as soon as we start seeing some good data come out of that, um, that can help inform our greenhouse gas calculations, um, there may be an opportunity to explore funding for those as well. Okay, um, with regard to greenhouse gas emission reductions, um, is there kind of a, 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 a standard amount that would be associated with digesters? So if a dairy had a digester versus they don't, um, what might be the greenhouse gas emission reduction? And I guess one way of looking at that would be on a per cow basis? Right. Um, so you're correct in that it really depends on the number of cows that are on the dairy um, that that number um, of reductions would be. On an average per cow, it could be anywhere between three to seven tons of CO2 per cow. But again, that depends a lot on exactly the type of manure management that was taking place before the digester got put in. There can be some nuances in that um, management style that affects that number. Um, it's also affected by whether it, they're Jersey cows or Holstein cows because they have different efficiency with which they convert their feed into milk versus manure. Um, so the way we kind of look at it in our program, if we look at the total reductions from a single dairy, um, and then we look at the cost effectiveness, so for per cost, per dollar cost of the project, um, and then instead of looking at it from a per cow, because of the variation in the cow, we normalize it by um, per um, unit of milk production, and the milk production is corrected for its energy efficiency for the cow breed. Um, so, we, you know, we've worked with uh, Dr. Deanne Meyer, who's a very well-known cooperative extension specialist out of UC Davis, who's done a lot of work in feed um, efficiency to kind of develop that energy corrected milk number. Um, so instead of normalizing by number of cows, we normalize based on milk production that way. Okay, thank you. 
Um, do you require a minimum efficiency of methane production in order to be more than just a passive capture process? So I guess that would relate to maybe a um, just covering a lagoon versus um, actually putting in an active uh, uh, anaerobic digester. Is there is there any right. minimum efficiencies? Yeah, we we actually do not have a minimum efficiency, and the main reason for that is that whether to put in a covered lagoon digester or a tank style digester really is a business decision from the dairy producer about what makes sense to put on their dairy, um, what how they currently manage it. Sometimes even the location of the you know the milk parlors, the barn. Uh, versus lagoon, all those things kind of play a role. Um, so our program is in that sense kind of technology neutral. Um, in terms of accounting for the competitiveness based on greenhouse gas, um, we actually look at, um, you know, the greenhouse gas number that we look at is based on a baseline number. And what that baseline means is what you were doing on the dairy before you put in a digester. Um, and then only the reduction of those original emissions are accounted. Um, in a tank style digester or in a different digester where, you know, there might be a temperature control and that helps, you know, optimize or increase the bacterial activity so that they can boost methane for their, um, just for the energy generation piece, that extra methane is not counted in our tracking because that extra methane would not have been there without the digester on the farm in the first place. So we tr actually try to distinguish just the reductions from baseline that way. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of benefit for folks to consider those type of technologies because when they can boost their energy generation, they can get a better revenue from either the utility company they're selling the gas to, but also from that credit program for low carbon fuel standard credit. Um, so there are avenues for, um, for financial support of the extra methane. Um, our program, though, focuses more on that baseline reduction because, um, you know, just that legislation that kind of drives our, our goals here. Okay, as it relates to um, methane escape and in, in the um, operation of these digester projects, is there any uh, effort required to monitor for methane leaks, um, either at the dairies or throughout the pipeline system? Yeah, so there are, so this, this is such a great question because we know that there are some level of leaks at every step, right? Um, more or less from what our understanding is there are less than 10% of the total methane production, uh, but that's still important. Uh, the place where they really get accounted for um, are the fact that, you know, because these projects are participating in those low carbon fuel standard credits, as well as the carbon offset market that exists in California for carbon credits, um, each pound or each ton of methane that's produced is uh, metered and monitored and verified. Um, you know, to qualify for the credit programs. The credit programs have a very um, strict auditing process by which they um, measure that. Um, so that metering of the methane gives a pretty good idea of what might be the leaks. And what we've seen is it's less than 10%. Um, and the leaks do get accounted for in our calculation. So we don't assume that 100% of the baseline emissions are being reduced. We still account for a little bit of that leakage in our calculation that way. Um, but that, you know, compared to what the emissions were before, that's a significantly lower number. Um, so that definitely helps. Okay. Um, as it relates to some of the alternative uh, management practices, uh, in particular focusing on uh, windrow composting, is there a um, requirement for dust control? Um, so, yeah. So it again, like this is kind of where that interesting piece comes in, all of the different regulations in California that, um, you know, producers have to deal with. Uh, so while we incentivize the composting from our program, um, the production of compost um, is actually regulated in California by a department called Department of Resource Recycling and Recovery. Um, they are our primary state agency that deals with waste management. Um, so they have compost producing facilities under their jurisdiction. So up to a certain size of a farm and certain ton of compost, um, you know, they are kind of covered by right into how much they can produce. And that includes, um, you know, if there's any potential impact from dust. But really the large size dairies or a very large amount of compost production, they need to get permits from that particular agency. And that includes air quality permits, 
which account for the dust production as well. So again, from our perspective, we just basically make sure that the projects that we're funding have all of their permits in place, uh, but we are not the lead agency in actually issuing for those permits and directly regulating the things like H2S or dust production. Okay. Um, so obviously California has invested and continues to invest in digesters. Um, through the uh, last few decades, there have been efforts across the U.S., and it seems like um, these sometimes these fall out of favor or they just aren't successful. Um, what do you think might be unique about California um, and the, the ability for you to be able to sustain this over time? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, this is kind of where we all started a few years ago in California as well. Um, there had been producers who were early adopters who were very innovative and they wanted to try digesters. And, um, you know, there has been actually a significant history of failed digesters in California. So when we first started having these conversations, there was a lot of skepticism. And this kind of coincides with when Secretary Karen Ross uh, started her term in California. One of the things she really made a priority was um, trying to understand why digesters are not popular in California. So even before the program started, there was an interagency working group composed of state agency experts and federal experts. You know, there are folks at NRCS who also work on digesters, um, as well as researchers um, and involvement with industry to discuss, well, why have these projects been failing? Um, and so some of the big reasons that we found uh, through that process were relating, related to the permitting hurdles um, and just kind of understanding that you know, air quality in California was a, um, you know, it has always been a topic of concern and uh, there might have been instances where digesters that were set up a long time ago, over time, the equipment that they had became non-compliant with new air regulations that resulted in a compliance cost from the producer that was hard to meet. And then another reason that we heard um, often loud and clear was just there was just a little too much of engineering required to maintain a digester and keep it working, uh, continue to find spare parts to fix issues. Um, and the old model was, you know, a company would come build a digester and then they would leave. And it was just very challenging for producers to keep the digester running and going. Um, and so the interesting thing is that we have been able to, oh, and finally, the another really important piece was that um, we did not have, um, you know, policy measures in place in the state to get a fair price for the biogas or the biogas electricity to the producer. Um, so the utility companies back in the day, they did not want to pay um, a higher price for biogas related energy um, in comparison to fossil fuel. And biogas is just a little more expensive to produce than fossil fuel. So mostly a lot of the reasons were economic and regulatory related. So at the time of starting this program, that's where we kind of came in. So the biggest improvement is that we've allowed these developer producer partnership models to come in where the developer is committed to the operation and maintenance by having a share in the profit. Um, they are committing to that piece. Um, we've also just statewide have passed many different legislations and policies that have guaranteed um, a pricing mechanism for the biogas. For electricity, um, we, we used to have um, the feed-in tariff program, which um, I'm not sure if it has expired or is set up for a renewal, but at least in the past three to four years, you know, the electric producers have been able to get a fair price for their electricity that way. But going forward, um, we work together with the California Public Utilities Commission. That's the agency that regulates um, biogas pipelines um, to be able to set up these infrastructures um, for pipeline injection. They have also funded projects similar to the way we have uh, uh, dedicated to that pipeline infrastructure development. Um, so there are many different steps that we're taking across the board and hoping that um, you know some of these problems that we've heard of in the past have been addressed by these issues. And so far, we've been hearing good news. So that's been exciting. Okay, and I think the last question we'll uh, take today on the live webcast is, um, is there a maximum size or a minimum size of a dairy? And, you know, so is there a cutoff, in other words, you know, if you had 100 cows or 1,000 cows, do you, do you need uh, to be involved in the program? So, or, or is it uh, the program kind of any, any, uh, any size fits all? 
Yeah, the program is designed to be any size that fall. Um, and of course, the main reason for that is that, you know, as a state agency with the mission to protect and promote agriculture, uh, we've kind of kept our programs open for participation by all of the producers. Um, that said, we have heard from developers in the past that um, they used to consider a minimum size of a dairy um, a necessity for participation to keep the digester feasible and achieve significant economy of scale that way. Um, I would say I think when the program was for first starting, that number, I mean, again, like we haven't done studies to verify this, but the number we heard thrown around a lot was like, oh, you need at least 3,000 cows. Uh, but that said, we are seeing now um, digesters, especially with the cluster infrastructure that has been developed, a lot of the uh, you know, expensive equipment is in that centralized part, and that is now allowing smaller dairies to come participate and become one of the participants in the cluster. Um, so we're definitely seeing um, smaller dairies also kind of starting to come in in that cluster model as well. Um, but our AMMP program specifically also has a lot of smaller dairies participate. Um, in California, though, I'll just the caveat to all of this is in California, our average dairy size is about over 1,300 cows. Um, so even like a 1,000 or 2,000 cow dairy is still in kind of that small size category for us. Um, which is, I know that's different from the national averages. Okay, well, thank you. Well, this was a, a very informative uh, webcast today. I have a good set of questions, and um, so thank you for uh, participating with us today. Thank you, Gatika, for today's webinar. Great, thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate it.